All right, well, I should, I should mention, if I haven't already in advance, this, this can be a really large subject. Um, how big, you know, William Gurnall's book, The Christian in Complete Armor, 1,200 pages of non-redundant ex exhortations to um, uh, just to be aware of the devil and to be equipped against him. Uh, we're not going to go through all that material, though I'm sure it would all be very um, profitable. By the way, William Gurnall is kind of an unknown in many ways Puritan. He is really insightful. You know, I, I would put him up against the, you know, the, what we consider to be the best of the Puritans. Um, very insightful guy. But what we're going to be looking at is Thomas Brooks in his smaller work, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. And I want to read the text again, the text that he uses, 2 Corinthians 10, excuse me, 2, verse 11, but just giving it to us in context. He says in verse 10, Paul to the Corinthians, but one whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ, so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. Now, the thing that we've looked at last week is the fact that there is a being called Satan who is seeking to take advantage of us. Okay, so that's one thing that Paul tells us in this passage. The second thing he tells us is that he has schemes. He has various ways to do that. Uh, and we need to make sure we're not ignorant. You know, we, we, you know he tells the Corinthians we're not ignorant, but um, I think that perhaps we are in, in many ways. And if we're not ignorant of the schemes, we forget they exist and we fall into them anyway. So this is a call to watchfulness. Okay, so again, last week, as I already mentioned, we were considering the fact that we do have this enemy, an invisible enemy. We cannot see him roaming around, but we've already been you know, heard from Peter. We need to be on our guard against him because he's constantly working to try to take some advantage of us, ultimately to draw us away from God because he knows how that's going to affect us spiritually. Remember what James told us? And I'm going to keep repeating this because we, we need to... Um, we really need to practice this, okay? He says, draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. And when God draws near to us, as we draw near to Him, remember, our love for Him grows stronger, and that's what needs to happen for us to be strong and fruitful Christians. But Satan knows if he can draw us away from God, that it will have the opposite effect. It will weaken our love. Now, we know Satan cannot destroy us if we belong to, to Christ, if we belong to the Lord. If we don't, he can very well do that, okay? And he's going to try to do that. And sometimes when we hear Brooks saying what he's saying, I'm going to quote him a few times in this series, it, it may sound like he's saying to, to the church, because these were sermons that he preached, that you need to be careful, you need to watch out for Satan because he wants to drag you to hell with himself. Well... The question then that comes up is, can Satan do that? Well, he can't if we're true Christians. But in Brooks' days, as, as in our day, there are those who believe themselves to be Christians who really aren't. And Satan can drag those into hell. So we need to watch out for him either way. Okay? But again, if we're trusting in Christ, he cannot destroy us, but he can weaken us. He can neutralize us. He can put us on the sidelines and make us completely unfruitful and no threat to him. And that's what he's trying to do. Now, we noted last week, too, that his names tell us quite a bit about his character. Jesus, in the Lord's Prayer, calls him the evil one. And that's because his nature is that of pure evil. He's called Satan in Scripture. Satan means adversary. And that's what he is to us. He is our enemy. He is our adversary. And he's called the devil because devil means slanderer, okay? He is the accuser, and he not only accuses us to God, but he also accuses us to our face in order to shame us, in order to, again, neutralize us. Now, his main weapon is deceit. He, you know, we're going to see this over the next several weeks. Jesus reminds us in John 8, that he is a liar and the father of lies, and lie, his lying is, is his main way of working, but he has differing ways to deceive us, and that's what we want um, to see. Now, 
Let's not forget again also what we saw about why Satan hates us, why he's our adversary, why he wants to deceive and slander us. He was once a holy angel. It's been argued perhaps the greatest that God ever created. He was created along with the other angels for various reasons, to witness God's creation, to give him glory as they saw his wondrous works, uh, to guard his holiness. We see angels surrounding the throne. We see angels guarding the garden. Satan was one of those. He was a cherub. But also to serve those who inherit salvation. Now, Jonathan Edwards believes that that last reason God created the angels is the reason why Satan fell. Remember when God announced his plan for Satan and the angels that they were going to be the servants of those so far below them, Satan could not stand the idea of submitting and serving those, and he rebelled. And of course, in this rebellion, we know he was completely void of God's Holy Spirit. His heart became absolutely evil. He became bent on fighting against God. But since he couldn't hurt God, he immediately set out to destroy God's creation. He set out to destroy those made in his image. That's the reason why Satan attacks us, because of his hatred of God. And man, of course, is made in the image of God. He's doing everything he can to thwart God's work. And I think we have to recognize, if the Lord did not restrain the devil, and he does, thankfully, but if he didn't restrain him, if the devil had free reign to do whatever he wanted to do, the devil is very powerful, and he literally could take us and tear us limb from limb. He could vaporize us if he, if he wanted to, but he can't do that, you see, because God restrains him. He's on God's chain, on a leash, so to speak. He can only go so far and no farther. And we see that when the devil, of course, wanted to do something to Job, but he couldn't because God put a hedge around him, and so Satan needed permission. And he always needs permission whenever he does anything toward us. But remember, this is another thing we have to bear in mind. God does sometimes give him permission, like he does, or like he did in the case of Job. And he uses Satan, like he uses all the evil that exists in this world for his good purposes. He allows Satan to test us from time to time. Why does Jesus tell us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, you know, and do not lead us into testing, but deliver us from the evil one. Why does he, why does he say pray to God that, that he would not do that? It's because he does allow that from time to time in order that we might grow stronger. And I do have, um, I think, a biblical theory. And that is if we're working on building ourselves up in our weak areas, you know, all the time and we're doing everything we can, I don't think Satan... God's going to give Satan permission to do anything to us because we're already doing what we should be doing, but it's when we're not doing and pursuing what we should be doing that he brings the enemy in to strengthen us in that area. He causes the wind to blow, so to speak, so that our roots will go deeper and we'll grow stronger. And so we are called to watch for his attacks, okay, in Scripture because he does attack, because God does allow it. Again, 1 Peter 5 eight, be of sober spirit, be on the alert, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So here's a warning, and we've already read the warning from Paul. Be aware of his schemes. Now, I already mentioned Thomas Brooks, the author of the book, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices that we're going to be using in this series, tells us that very few people in his day, very few, we're actually doing that. You know, we're actually watching for him. And we're, we're ready to repel him. Most people, he said, in his day did not believe the devil existed or that if he did, he didn't pose any threat. Now, as Christians, we know the Bible says he exists. But how many of us fall into that second category if he does or he does? But he's really not a threat. He is a threat. Otherwise, there wouldn't be these warnings in Scripture. Now, we do need to remember that in Thomas Brooks' day, and I think he, um, I know in Elizabeth's day, everybody was required to go to a Protestant church. It was the law. It was the way to weed out Roman Catholicism out of England because they believed she was an illegitimate queen because, you know, she took the church away from Rome. Well, actually, Henry did that. 
but they wanted to bring, you know, they wanted to come back in and take over England and they wanted to get rid of her, so they slandered her in that way. So she got back at them and she said, okay, no Roman Catholicism in the land. Everyone's going to be a Protestant. Uh, but after her, there were others that um, may have been more lax on that, but I think it was still the law of the land. Everybody had to go to the Anglican Church. So when Thomas Brooks says this, he's speaking to a congregation that he knows. Okay, if you have everybody in England that's coming to church, what are you going to suspect about some of the people who are there? You know, they're not Christians. If you read the Bible, you're going to suspect that most of them are not Christians, okay? When Jonathan Edwards was ministering to his congregation in Northampton, there were something like 700 families, but they all went to church. Why did Edwards speak to them the way he did? It's because he knew that most of them were not believers. So when he says, okay, most don't believe the Bible or that the devil exists, or if he does exist, he's no threat, he's talking to people in the church, both believers and unbelievers, and if that was true, of course, in his day, that that was the view, how much more should be today? Uh, how much more do we think it might be today? Because of everything that the world is doing to try to basically cover over the supernatural and explain everything by way of science. You know, unbelievers are oblivious to the fact that Satan is driving every agenda, every perverse agenda in this world, everything contrary to the will of God. He is trying to overthrow God's order. That he is not only doing that, but he is also influencing everything that they do. As I mentioned, every, even every, not every, most professing Christians seem to be unaware of his activities. Now, that we know that he's working out there. You know, we know that he's involved in all these things that are going on that are perverse, but what about the personal attacks? You know, it seems like we, we, we don't think about those as much as we should. So maybe we've fallen into the same error that uh, Thomas Brooks was addressing in his day. Now, the point is we do need to watch out for him, especially in light of what it is he wants to do to us. Let me give you a taste of Brooks uh, and his language, okay? <clears throat> Very picturesque. Let me, let me mention this too. You know, Charles Spurgeon, whom we, we highly appreciate, was a master illustrator, right? He knew how to use illustration things that he saw in nature, uh, current events. Uh, he could even take a chair or whatever. He could make it into some sort of analogy that he wanted to uh, make. Well, a lot of what he gets, he gets from Thomas Brooks. And he, he wrote of Brooks that Brooks scatters the stars with both hands. And he says that, that the filings, you know, like picturing Thomas Brooks as a jeweler who's working on jewelry, and as he's filing the jewelry, some of those filings fall to the ground. He's saying that what falls to the ground in Brooks's works are better than what most people have, you know, because Brooks put all these different comments in, in the, the margins. He had so much material if it wasn't in the text, it was in the margin. He says, what he says in the margins is better than what most people say. So he really appreciated Brooks. But this is what Brooks writes. Satan being fallen from light to darkness, from felicity to misery, from heaven to hell, from an angel to a devil, is so full of malice and envy that he will leave no means unattempted whereby he may make all others eternally miserable with himself. He being shut out of heaven and shut up under the chains of darkness till the judgment of the great day makes use of all his power and skill to bring all the sons of men into the same condition and condemnation with himself. So I want you to notice, okay, Satan hates us. His goal is to destroy us. I don't know if you noticed this or not, but he made reference to Jude 6, where it talks about the angels being under darkness and chains. He says, Satan is one of those angels. That's not a special group of angels that fell. That's all the angels who fell. They are all under chain. They are all under darkness. They are all under God's judgment. And yet, they are still doing things in the world. So Brooks reminds us we need to look out for him. And he would also remind us that the devil already has much more influence in our lives than we realize. He continues in this quote, Satan has cast such sinful seed into our souls that now he can no sooner tempt, but we are ready to assent 
He can no longer have a plot against us, but he makes a conquest of us. What he's saying is we're easy prey for the enemy because he's already done such work in, in our hearts and in our minds. So the question is, what is he doing? How has he done this? How is he influencing us? Okay, what is his strategy? Well, here's a couple things we want to think about. You know, first of all, his, his main strategy with regard to us personally, okay, is that he watches us and he studies us. He studies mankind, and he knows we all have a lot in common, right? He knows our weaknesses in general. But he also studies us as individuals that he might best know how to tempt us. Okay, if we ask the question, why, why did Satan tempt David, King David, in the areas in which he did? On one occasion, he tempted him to number the soldiers in his army. Well, Brooks would say it's because he knew that David's weakness was pride. And he took a great deal of pride in his power and in his army. And so he moved David to count them so that he might become prouder and also that he might fall under God's censure. You know how you read in, in the, those historical books of the Old Testament, it says God's anger burned against Israel and it moved David to number the people. In the other book, it says Satan stood up against Israel and he moved David to number the people. Well, God was using Satan to provoke David to number the people because of the sins that were going on there. But Satan tempted him in his weakest area. Why did he tempt David with Bathsheba? Okay. Because he knew David was, had a weakness for women. That's one that's, that's common among men. But we already know that because he had not just one wife, but he had many wives. So he knew that if he saw her bathing on her rooftop, that he would likely be tempted to take her. And he did. And he fell. And it led to even worse things. It led to murder. Why did Satan tempt Judas with money to betray Jesus? Well, let's not forget what Judas was doing during the entire earthly ministry of our Lord. Judas was a greedy man. He was the one, interestingly enough, that was given the task of guarding the money bag that was the, you know, the, the communal money that, the, that Jesus and his disciples had by way of contributions, and he would regularly steal from that bag. Well, Satan knew his weakness, and he tempted him to betray Jesus with money. Now, here's another taste of Brooks writing. Satan loves to sail with the wind and to suit men's temptations to their conditions and inclinations. If they're in prosperity, he will tempt them to deny God, Proverbs 30, verse 9. If they're in adversity, he will tempt them to distrust God. If their knowledge is weak, he will tempt them to have low thoughts of God. If their conscience is tender, he will tempt them to scrupulosity. If large, to carnal security. If bold-spirited, he will tempt to presumption. If timorous, to desperation. So the point is, he knows our vulnerabilities. He knows where we're weakest, and he's going to attack those areas, not where we're the strongest. Go figure, right? I mean, Satan has some, some intelligence, some wisdom, and he's going to go for our Achilles heel, so to speak. And that's why Paul exhorts us, again, as we've seen in uh, the Armor of God passage in Ephesians 6, put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. He's reminding us that Satan is no pushover. Jesus did not call him the strong man for nothing. We're never going to be able to resist him without the armors and the weapons that God provides. Okay, so that's his overall strategy go for the weak area, right? Which is why we have to have the full armor on to protect every area. But now we might ask a little bit more specifically, how does he attack? You know, how does he attack those vulnerabilities? Well, his main weapon is deceit. Now, last week we read another passage, what Paul wrote to Timothy. And he was telling Timothy that he needed to gently correct those who were in opposition to the truth in the hope that God might grant them repentance, and then he says this, that they might come to their senses, literally, that they might think right again, or think rightly again, and escape the snare of the devil. Now, notice what he's saying here is, correct those in opposition because their thinking 
is askew. They're not thinking correctly. They're not seeing things the way they should see them. They need to think right again. They need to come to their senses. Why are they thinking incorrectly? It's because Satan has deceived them. Okay? This is one of his snares. Satan has the ability to make us think wrongly that he might lead us away from God. You know, I think it was Ken Ham years ago wrote a book called The Lie, and it was addressing the fall of Adam and Eve. You know, likes to focus on the book of Genesis, but that's exactly how Satan overcame Adam and Eve was by deceiving them, making them think incorrectly, okay? So we want to address that. He has a variety of ways of doing that. So let's first, let's just look at one of those deceptions. And I think as we look at this, we're all going to have to say, you know what? Satan has done that to me, and I've fallen for it. So being aware that this is how he works, is, it's going to be half the battle, right? Knowing this is how he works, when you then see this happening, you know what he's doing, you know what's behind it, and you know to avoid it, okay? So that's a summary of this, <laughs> this first point. So his first deception, his first snare, is to get us to focus on the things that we think we're going to gain from sin rather than the consequences of that sin. Sound familiar? Okay. Brooks has a much more colorful way of putting this using the analogy of fishing. Satan shows us the bait, but he hides the hook. Deception. Isn't that what we do when we go fishing? We're trying to deceive the fish, aren't we? We, we put these pieces of meat on there or maybe these uh, baits that look like minnows or wounded minnows and there's a hook that's buried in there, you know, and we're, we're trying to deceive the fish into going for it. And he thinks he's getting a mouthful of food, but instead he gets hooked. Okay, that's exactly what Satan does to us. Brooks writes this. He loves to present the sweet, the pleasure, and the profit that may flow in upon the soul by yielding to sin and by hiding from the soul the wrath and misery that will certainly follow the committing of sin. And Brooks would also remind us that Satan is really a very good fisherman. He knows exactly how to bait our, you know, how to bait his hooks when it comes to us. Again, because he studied us and he knows our weaknesses. Now again, think about how he deceived Adam and Eve, right? God told Adam and Eve that if they ate of the tree, they would die. Now, Satan, as he comes to them, first of all, hides the hook, you know, he denies in the strongest possible way, you surely will not die. And then what did he do? He pointed to the benefit if they ate. In the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So he dangles the bait in, in front of their eyes, but he works to hide the hook. Um, and of course, we know what happened. When Jesus was in the wilderness, here's a contrary um, example, the devil tried to do the same thing to him, okay? The devil showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their glory, and he said, all these things I will give to you because they've been handed over to me. That's what he said, and he was right. All these things have been handed to me, and I will give them over to you if you simply bow down and worship me. But, of course, the hook is it would cost him his relationship with the Father. Now we know that there is no bait in the world that is going to tempt or attract our Lord Jesus. Jesus did not go for it. Jesus knew that if he did that, he would be dishonoring his Father, and he also knew that his Father had promised him these things anyway, right? The road was going to be harder, but it was going to honor his Father, and so he chose that path. Now, sadly, the same thing isn't true of us as it is of Christ, though we are exhorted that it should be, right? When Satan dangles the bait in front of our eyes, which he does more often than perhaps we realize, we too often focus on the bait and, and we don't see the hook. We, we, we seem to be oblivious to the fact that that sin is going to cost us exactly as God warns us it will. Now again, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but just... Think about your own experience, okay? Have any of you ever fallen into sin? 
if you say no, you know you're in trouble, right? Because uh, we have all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Solomon tells us there is no man who, who lives a perfect life and does not sin. We all have fallen into sin. But why? Why do we fall into that temptation and sin? Think about what you were looking at when you made that choice. What is it that you saw that was so attractive that made you decide to choose it? Maybe the pleasure that it would give you. Maybe something else you thought you were going to gain from it. But thinking back, or maybe even thinking presently, I don't know, think about the results. The results of having gone for the, the bait and the hook that was behind it. Think about the guilt. Think about the shame. Think about the distance that you felt from God after you did that. Now, Brooks is asking the question, was it really worth it? And we know that it isn't. Okay? We know it isn't worth it. We, we know that somehow coming in, but somehow we're not convinced. But you see, every time the devil succeeds in bringing us into sin, it is going to cost us something, something in our relationship to God. And again, likening this or relating this to what we saw before, the cost is this. Our, well, we're going, to be, we're going to be more distant from him. Our love for him is going to be weakened. When it's weakened, our obedience is going to trail off and our fleshly desires are going to become stronger and we're going to find ourselves doing things, sinful things that we would not otherwise do on top of the sin that we've already committed. And again, let me just point to um, David as a classic example. He saw Bathsheba. He fell into sin with Bathsheba. But that's not all he did. After he realized, of course, what he did when the temptation was over, um, he realized that um, with Bathsheba now being pregnant, that he had to do something to cover that sin. And again, we look at that and we're somewhat bewildered. Why didn't Bathsheba say something to her husband? But apparently David was counting on her silence. But he couldn't get Uriah to go into her, so he finally has to put Uriah to death. Think about how one sin led to these other sins. And that's exactly what happens. That's why the devil is trying to get us to fall into the sin in the first place. Now, we know it's true that the Lord is often using this. He's allowing it, right? So, um, he, he can use even our falls into sin to bring us closer to Him. As a matter of fact, as Christians, that's what He does all the time. He works evil for good. And there's a reason why He's allowing Satan to tempt us, right? But think about this. It's also true, with a few exceptions, that we would be stronger more in love with the Lord, closer to Him, if we didn't fall into sin in the first place. So with few exceptions, again, this is more of a, an Edwardsian idea that I've kind of introduced here. Uh, Edwards knows that sometimes, you know, God allows us to fall into sin, and we come out on the other end when we repent and get back on the path stronger than we were, better than if we hadn't fallen into sin he says there are cases where that happens. In any case, we're going to be stronger each time. But he compares that with what if we were confronted with the sin and we didn't give in to it? Where would we be then? Okay, well, he says in most cases we'd be actually further along if we did that. Although there's some, there are some exceptions where we'd be further along if we fell into sin. Most often we, we do grow stronger, but not as strong as we would if we didn't sin in the first place. I hope we understand that distinction. So um, it, it, it's better if we don't fall into sin in the first place. If it were our advantage, always to our advantage to fall, then why would the Lord command us to stand? Okay? And why would he give us the means to stand? Okay? So the point is, yes, God can work evil for good, but we shouldn't use that as an excuse not to pay attention, not to resist sin, not to look out for Satan, that if I fall into sin, I'm going to be better in the long run, so maybe I should just fall into sin. No, we need to be on our guard against him. So the question is, what do we do about this particular temptation? How do we, how do we avoid this sin? Well, Brooks counsels us, I think not surprisingly, don't play with the bait, <laughs> okay? Stay as far away from the things that tempt you as possible because of its danger. Now, I, I forget whether I got this from Brooks or not, but think about this. If somebody were in the street with an automatic rifle, 
and was shooting people indiscriminately, would you run out into the street and begin waving around saying, hey, look, here I am? If you saw a snake that was coiled on the ground, maybe you've seen that before. My dad used to take my brother and I when we were really young, hiking in the woods or in, in the mountains. And um, one time we're going down a path and all of a sudden there's a rattlesnake and it starts to rattle. And before I knew it, I was just a little guy. My, my dad picked me up and I looked back and I could see it was coiled and it was just maybe two feet away from us, uh, close enough to strike. Would, if you saw that coiled rattlesnake, would you try to pick it up? <laughs> you know, would, would you go near it? You know, no, you wouldn't because you know it's dangerous, right? Well, sin is much more dangerous than a man with a gun or a coiled rattlesnake. Those things can only hurt the body. Remember what Jesus said on one occasion, don't fear those that can harm the body, but fear the one who has the authority to cast body and soul into hell. Sin can destroy our souls. It's much more dangerous than anything that can hurt us physically, which is why we need to stay back from it. Uh, it was said of Anselm, and here we have Brooks again. He uses all these examples from church history. A 12th century believer, maybe you've heard of Anselm, he wrote that very uh, famous book, Her Deus Homo, which means why the God-man, okay? He wrote this, that if he should see, somebody wrote this about Anselm, that if he should see the shame of sin on the one hand and the pains of hell on the other and must choose one, he would rather be thrust into hell without sin than to go into heaven with sin. So great was his hatred and detestation of sin. You know, hell might be a, you know, a pain, might be a physical pain, but sin is much more dangerous and much worse. And some had some other choice things to say about sin. He, he, he would, I think on another occasion he said, let the whole creation be destroyed rather than I should tell one lie. Okay? So he hated sin, and we should have that attitude towards sin. Uh, Paul tells us in Romans 12, verse 9, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. And the word abhor here means to be repulsed by it, to utterly hate evil and sin, everything morally corrupt, everything that is contrary to God's holy law of love. So the best way not to be hurt by sin, not to fall into Satan's snare, is to steer clear of it, not even to get close to it. And then Brooks addresses those who like to see how close they can get without falling. You know, that happens too. You're playing with the bait, right? Well, he says the best way to keep from falling into a pit is to stay away from the edge. And Brooks warns us if we want to stand at the edge and look into the pit, God may very well let us fall into it in order to teach us to stay away from it. You know, that, I think that most often happens when you begin playing with the bait or you begin edging towards it. Satan is already gaining, as it were, the, you know, uh, the submission of your heart towards that thing. He's already got you if you begin inching towards it, okay? Stay away from it. He points out when Potiphar's wife tempted Joseph, he ran away and he avoided sin. But when David was tempted with Bathsheba, he didn't run and he fell. So the first thing is, Keep away from it, okay? Secondly, he tells us, though sin may appear to offer some benefits, even though it may promise pleasure, it will bring grief and sorrow. You know, think about Adam and Eve when they saw the forbidden fruit and Satan played up its desirability. That's how they saw it. But think about what happened when he ate it, okay? When the sin was consummated, he lost paradise, for himself and for all of his children. Esau, remember when he was hungry and he saw the stew that Jacob made and they struck a deal, you know, he thought that stew was going to benefit him. You know, it's going to satisfy my hunger. So he gave up the blessing, the blessing that would have been his, his firstborn. He traded it away forever. He saw the bowl of stew, but he didn't think about the consequences. So even though there seems to be something good in sin, we need to realize it's just an illusion. It's just a deception of the enemy. Brooks argues in this way, if there were the least real delight in sin, there could be no perfect hell. 
where men shall most perfectly be tormented with their sin. See, hell is a place of torment. There can't be any pleasure in sin because that's all that hell is, is a place of sin and torment. So he says there really is no real pleasure in sin. Now, we might argue, though, well, it also says in Scripture that sin can be pleasant for a season. You know, and we might think it's bringing us pleasure, but the point is it brings nothing but grief. So see for what it is. It's a deception and illusion. Thirdly, he says we need to remember that sin brings the greatest possible losses to our souls. It's going to cost us more than anything else, which is why Anselm hated it. We lose the influence of God's Spirit. We lose the joy unspeakable and full of glory. We lose the comfort and strength the Spirit gives to us. We lose the sense of, of God's loving us as His child. We lose our assurance when we fall into sin. And we also lose, not entirely, we don't lose these things entirely, but we lose a great deal of them, our love for Him. Think about what David said in Psalm 51. When he fell into sin with Bathsheba and murdered Uriah, he prays to the Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation. It's because this the loss of the Spirit, not entirely, not fully, but his influences, you know, a great deal of it, he lost that joy, which was his most prized treasure and should be ours as well. Sin takes what is most precious from us, even if only temporarily. And then finally, he says we need to remember that sin is deceitful. I think we've already seen that. The author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 3.13, but encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Well, Brooks compares sin to Delilah. Uh, she betrayed Samson into the hands of the Philistines. Okay? Samson thought he was going to get one thing, but he ends up getting something else. He says sin is exactly like that. We think we're going to get something good, but it betrays us into the hands of the devil. It gives him grounds to accuse us and to condemn us both to God and to our consciences. So, to summarize this first point, sin promises pleasure, but it brings only pain and loss. It lies to us, okay? And so we need to keep as far away from it as we can. Don't play with the bait. Don't get near the edge of the pit, because if you do, you'll fall in, okay? Stay away from it. Well, may the Lord help us to actually put that uh, into practice. Let's, um, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask him to do that. And as we think about where, the, where Satan may have tempted us and where we have fallen to, um, to him in certain areas, let's also repent before the Lord as we're preparing to come to the table.